Hey everyone, welcome to Frame Academy Project 5 Part 4. This is the final uh, section of this project here and we're going to get into 360 degree videos or video spheres as they are sometimes called. So let's, uh, let's dive right in. First I want to show you sort of what the end result will be um, when you go through this. So you'll see an additional sphere now next to the photosphere that we set up before. And when you click on it, it will expand out and it is a uh, 360 video and then when you click on the back home button it'll take us right back okay so let's see how it was all set up um, the first thing that I did was put an a video sphere entity in my HTML so this is an entity and <laughs> this is an entity that comes with a frame um, a video sphere and you'll see it uh, and by the way I've embedded this project just right sort of below the video here. And you can see it on line 81. And I've nested my video sphere entity inside of uh, a parent entity that includes the video sphere, the box that it's on, and also the plane here with this caption. So I've, I've nested all of those entities inside of uh, this parent entity called video sphere display. Now the A video sphere entity is a is a really cool one. It's it's essentially a sphere with a a video uh, a 360 video mapped onto it as a texture. So just like a regular A sphere, you have properties like radius that you couldn't use, for instance, on like an A box or an A plane. Um, I've set its initial radius to 0.7. And for the source of the video sphere, you want to use the uh, hash and then the ID of the asset that uh, you've hopefully already loaded inside of the A-Frame asset management system up here in A-Assets. So um, I, we already did that in part one of this project, but I did that you know, by dragging the video sphere into my assets folder, uh, clicking on it to get its URL and uh, then adding that into here uh, as a video element. Now up here, uh, you'll notice that I have autoplay as an attribute on this video element. And a quick note about autoplay, I mentioned this in the previous project, but not in the video, so you might have missed it. Um, autoplay means, as you might have guessed, that the video will start playing as soon as the scene loads. That's why the video actually is, is actually already running when you load up the site. But autoplay doesn't work on every browser in the way that you might expect. So for instance, on iPhones or iPads, uh, autoplay is like disabled because Apple didn't want those like video ads to just automatically be playing on websites. So they require a user interaction, like a click or what have you, in order to get the video to play. So even though we do have autoplay set up, um, when we make our component that actually makes the video sphere expand, we're also gonna have that component trigger a play just in case the user is on an iPhone or an iPad, they'll be set and the video will, will play for them as well. Okay, um, yeah, so the ID I have up here in the asset management system is sphere vid clip. And that's the ID you can use as the source for your uh, video sphere uh, entity down below in your HTML. That's why the source is sphere vid clip. Uh, after the hash sign. Okay, so that actually gets the video sphere to show up in your scene like this. But to actually get that interactivity in there where once you click on it, uh, it expands and plays, we need to make a component. So uh, I made a new JavaScript file for this. Uh, you can either just do a new file or you can copy an existing component. Uh, I made a new file. I named it uh, public slash js slash video sphere expand dot js. First, I copied and pasted in the starter code uh, that I have for all components that you can find in this component starter dot js file. I copied and pasted this in. I gave the component a name of uh, video sphere expand. You do that in the first line when you're kind of registering the component. And then the first thing I wanted to do was make the references that I need to the different things that I'm gonna be uh, sort of modifying from my HTML. So if you remember from a previous project, there are a few ways you can kind of make references to 
your HTML elements. Uh, you can do it with document.query selector. This queries your HTML document. And then if you're just making a reference to uh, an element by using its ID, you can just use a hash and then the ID of the entity that'll make a reference to it. So I needed a reference to the, a few things. I needed a reference to the video sphere asset itself as it is uh, in the asset management system. So that ID is sphere vid clip. That's why I've got document.query selector uh, hash sphere vid clip that makes a reference to the video sphere asset. I needed a reference to the video sphere element in our scene. Uh, that ID is video sphere entity, and that's why you see document.query selector uh, hash video sphere entity. And then finally, I needed a reference to all of those elements that I want to have disappear once the video sphere expands. And we did this before when we set up the, um, the sphere expand component. We did it by uh, defining a variable called home world elements. And instead of query selector, we do query selector all because we're referencing a bunch of elements. And then instead of using a hash and the name of an ID, we use dot and then the name of a class. And the class that I've put on all of these elements that I want to have disappear once the uh, sphere expands is home world. So remember, IDs are unique. Uh, you can't have multiple elements with the same ID, but you can have multiple elements with the same class. And that's how you can reference a bunch of entities at once by doing query selector all on a certain class. Okay, perfect. Now we have the references that we need because these are going to be the things that we sort of manipulate. And let's think about what we want our component to do, right? It's a few things. On the one hand, we want to make the video sphere play if it's not already playing. We want to make the radius of the video sphere a lot bigger so that it actually takes up the whole sort of space around us. And we also want to make sure all of these uh, elements disappear, the ones that have the class equals home world in our HTML. They need to disappear so that the video sphere can be kind of front and center, and we don't have those like walls in here because that would look really strange. Okay, so we're going to write a function uh, that does all of this stuff. Uh, this is just defining the function, and then later on we will call the function. Uh, so I called, I, I named the function video sphere loader. Did a let video sphere loader equals, and then you actually write the function itself. Starts out with these uh, blank parentheses, still blank for now, the equals and the arrow sign, and then you've got curly braces. And inside of those curly braces, you put all that code that you'd like to run or execute as soon as this function gets called. So the first thing I'm doing uh, is doing a video source dot play. So remember up here, video source is the reference to uh, the video sphere asset itself. And that's what you want to reference to do uh, to actually cause it to play. We did this before in part three with just the flat video as well. We did a dot play on the video asset. So that'll actually cause the video sphere to play if it's not already playing because of autoplay. Now the next thing we want to do is set the radius of the video sphere entity, which is actually the sphere as it shows up in the scene, to be much bigger than what it starts out as. And I did a, uh, a set attribute for this. Remember, uh, you can do set attribute to modify any of the attributes on your uh, entities. And uh, just very simply did a set attribute on the radius to make it 4,200. Now, why did I pick 4,200? So I noticed that uh, when I set it to 5,000, that's what I first set it as. I tried that, and let me show you what happened. Some really strange stuff. <laughs> so I was thinking, okay, great. Click and expand, and look what happened. This is really gnarly, this is pretty bad. And it turns out that the sky element that we have in our scene, right? We've always had this uh, A sky that is that kind of starry night sky background. I checked in the documentation and 
The A sky element is actually a sphere with a radius of 5,000. So if you set the radius of the video sphere to expand out to 5,000, it's kind of mapped right onto the same radius as the sky, and then they conflict. They're kind of like mapped to the same sphere, and you have this weird conflict happening where it doesn't really know which one to show ahead of the other one. So it ends up just being this like garbled mess. So that's why um, instead of setting the attribute to 5,000, I set it to 4,200. And that way, when you click on it, you just see the video sphere because it's kind of inside of the A sky, such that you don't see the A sky, you just see the video sphere because its radius is a bit smaller. So the A sky is actually still there, but it's just outside of it, so you don't actually see it. Uh, you just see the video sphere. So that's why I did that there. And then just as we did with sphere expand, uh, sphere expand, I just copied and pasted this code that caused the, um, that'll cause the home world elements to disappear once uh, the function is called. And uh, I just copied and pasted that right in. It doesn't need to be any different. So no, uh, no harm in just copying and pasting it right in. It does a for each on our uh, list of home world elements that we gathered up here with query selector all. And then uh, it basically says for each uh, home world element, it runs this code. It does a set attribute visible false. Okay. Now this defines our function, but finally we need to actually call it. And we want this function to be called when the user clicks on the video sphere. So to do that, as we've done before, uh, we set up an add event listener to listen for the click event. Uh, the first uh, parameter you put in here is the name of the event you're listening for. We're listening for a click. And then the second parameter is the name of the function that you'd like to call once that event uh, is detected. And we put the name of our new function, video sphere loader. Now I added the event listener to this because I know that I'm going to put this whole component uh, onto our video sphere entity in the scene. And if you remember, this will always refer to the entity that the component gets attached to. Okay. So uh, I'm going to find uh, the entity here. And uh, you can see I've just, uh, the name of the component itself is video sphere expand. So I just put video sphere expand on my video sphere uh, element in my scene. And that means that, that this will actually refer to uh, this entity here, the video sphere. That's why when users click on the video sphere, uh, the click is detected and the video sphere loader function gets called. So then we're all set. Of course, you do want to make sure if this is a new JavaScript file that you made, you want to make sure you import that JavaScript file inside your head element uh, by using a script element. Uh, I did that here to script source equals and then the name of your new file. Mine's public slash JS slash video sphere expand. And then you should be good to go. Um, you can try it out, of course, in the project. It's embedded right here. And uh, it works just fine. The only other thing I had to change was to make sure that this back home button still worked. I needed to uh, add one line of code to it that just makes sure that if the user had the video sphere open, it brings its radius back down to 0.7, right? We don't want its radius to be 4,200 anymore. We need its radius to be its original value of Point seven. That's why when you click back home, the video sphere shrinks back down to its uh, starting size, that nice small little sphere there. Okay, and to, to do that, of course, you had to make a reference to that element itself. So I just did a let video sphere equals uh, document .query selector, and then I used the ID um, of the video sphere entity, just as I did here in my uh, video sphere expand component. Okay, so you should be good to go. Um, what I would what I'd like you to do is to uh, make this work with your own video sphere asset. Um, you can find video spheres just by kind of searching them out online, or maybe you've made some if you have a 360 camera. Um, I personally don't have one. I, I, I really like one, but I don't have one, but I, I just searched one out online. There are a few sites that have uh, like free open source video spheres that you can bring right in. You need to make sure that they're equirectangular. Uh, you can Google that. 
to figure out what that means. But I, I found that most video spheres that you find online are actually formatted this way. They are equirectangular, so they should work just fine. Um, so yeah, see if you can get this working with your own video spheres. Bring in one or two or however many you'd like in your scene. Just keep in mind that the more you have loaded inside of your uh, asset management system, the longer it will take for the site to load. Okay. Now, sometimes that's fine if you just know that it's going to be kind of a long load because you've got lots of content, but just something to be you know, aware of that uh, the more assets you have in there, the longer it'll take the site to load. Okay, congrats on making it through this project and let me know what you'd like to see next in future tutorials. If there's something you're trying to pull off that I haven't addressed in uh, projects one through five, let me know. I've already heard some really good ideas from some of you about uh, other projects to make and I'm going to be making those next. But yeah, feel free to let me know on Twitter or uh, our uh, Frame Academy online community is, is even better. All right, good luck. Let me know if you have any issues, questions, or ideas.